Um, our second speaker today is Nathan Scott. Nathan's, Nathan's a consultant with Achieve Ag Solutions based in Inverley in Victoria. He's got a background in prime lamb, merino wool and beef production and a passion for improving the productivity and profitability of livestock enterprises. He works with a range of producers to increase conception rates, improve lamb survival, lift growth rates and hone overall management. Nathan provides advice to individual clients, works with a large number of producer groups and is a keynote speaker at a range of industry events and industry projects. Nathan's talk today will cover the importance of goal setting, the roles for EID in livestock businesses. So please welcome Nathan. I just want to start with a reasonably simple question for you, and that is, if I was to bring a 15-year-old kid in, sit them down here in front of you, and ask you to tell them everything that excites you about the livestock industry at the moment, what would it be? What is it that gets you out of bed? What's, ex what's exciting about the livestock industry? Margins, returns. Yeah, so normally, normally it's price, isn't it? That's, at the moment, especially while prices are good, that 15-year-old kid's not going to have skin in the game for a while. By the time they do, there's a fair chance that our price situation may well have changed. We're in a commodity business. The reason I ask that question is I can ask that in any room and I get the same sort of blank looks. And it is a challenge for us. It's a challenge for all of us as an industry because other industries do have excitement. If I go to the cropping industry and I say to them, what excites you about the cropping industry? I get a very different answer. I'm going to show you a piece of technology from the cropping industry. It's weed seeking technology. So the spray unit only sprays where there's green matter. To be able to show you how good it is, they laid the weeds out in a pattern so that it would play Beat It by Michael Jackson. Now that's bloody exciting. The thing is, it's not just technology for technology's sake though. The chemical savings out of that piece of technology are massive. It's only spraying where there's green matter. So there's a reason for the technology as well. The challenge for us, and this is where I get to poke a bit of fun at our own industry, and I'm in the industry as well, so I'm allowed to do it. But if we look at the sheep industry, we started off with a handpiece that looked like this. And now we've got blue ones, red ones, and yellow ones. It's a bit harsh, it's a bit harsh, I understand that. But if that's our progress and, that's, and that's, that's the way we're perceived, then that's a problem for us. One of our challenges as an industry is we spend a lot of time telling people how hard we work. We wear it as a badge of honour. We work long hours, we work really hard. Any wonder we're having trouble getting young people into the industry, if that's the way we if present ourselves. The other risk we face is that everyone tells me this all the time, farmers won't change. Now I know that that's crap, because if that was true we wouldn't have a room full of people here. You're all here to learn something, you're all here to get new ideas, you're all home to go home and change something. We know that if we keep doing things the same way we've always done them, we'll keep getting the same results we've always got. So we have to change. That's why you're here. The challenge for all of us is that progress is more about people than it's ever going to be about money and technology, or equipment, or tools, bright and shiny things. It's always about people. Now in my job, I get the, the luxury of going and looking at a whole lot of farm businesses and in all reality, the recipe for sheep and cattle is reasonably straightforward. It's the people that are the, the, the more challenging component of it. I want you to reflect on yourselves for a moment, how you view your farming enterprise, how you go about your day to day. I'm going to use an example of one of our clients. So Gordon Brown, these are his, he runs a composite ewe flock. These are his mature marking percentages for the last four years. Amazing results, fantastic. That's, used, that's lambs marked to use join too. Real figures, not the pub figures. Now, that's not the bit that's exciting though. The bit that, is, is, the bit that is exciting is that Gordon's approach to his everyday running of his business. 
I'm going to show you a quick video. It's not to give True Test a plug. They just happened to make a video about Gordon Brown. And it gives you a little insight into the way he thinks. I'm Gordon Brown. I've been a farmer. I was born into the industry. I've been in it all my life. When I was younger, you'd have a crowbar and a shovel, a brace and bit drill, no electricity, no cordless drills. The tools we, we now have to work with are fantastic. If you start talking about EID tagging systems to keep control of your livestock, it's a huge improvement. There's a lot of livestock that go across the borders, swapping state to state, there needs to be control. As a manager, you've got to make decisions for the well-being of the property and the livestock. You can make decisions with informed data. It begins, obviously, by purchasing the tags, and we manually insert a tag in their ear. We've got this set of scales, a three-way drafter. Every animal sends its weaned off its mother's run through there to record the weight. We've got a spreadsheet with the top producing animals and the lower producing, so that decides whether we exit them or what sire lines, what genetics we use. There's, there's many tools in our toolbox that we can use if we have the information in front of us to make that decision. I think there's huge improvements to the lamb industry and this is all possible by using EID tags. It's made it easier, less guessing, more positive results, better for the industry, more profits, win-win situation. It's a, it's a no-brainer to me. I'm in boots and all. Farming's a tough gig, you know, and there's a lot of manual work. A lot of dust, a lot of heat, a lot of cold. But we've got to use tools to improve our, the, the results. If we've got something that'll assist us, we've got to move forward and, and jump on board with that. My favourite thing, thing every year is when I catch, catch up with Gordon after he's marked his lambs. And you saw what his marking results are. And we have a conversation about it, and he says, yep, they are the best results we've ever got but there's a few things I want to do differently next year. There's a few things I want to try because I think we can get it a bit better. He's never satisfied. That's the way I want you to think about your business. It might only be a small change. It might only be a little incremental change. But I want you to think about what it is you're trying to achieve in the first place and then work backwards from there. That's how we actually understand what the role of ag tech might be in helping you achieve what you're trying to set out. I just want to start with getting the basics though when we start talking about EID and individual animal management. And that is to understand that there is this bell-shaped curve. Every population, doesn't matter whether we're talking about cats, dogs, sheep, cattle, people, there is always this thing called population dynamics where we have a bell-shaped curve. Poor performers, average performers, superior performers. They always exist. Our job is to try and find them and understand them. Now, what's happening in your traditional mob-based system is, yeah, we will try and find the really obvious ones, the really obvious culls, the poor performers. But ultimately what happens is, across all of your age groups, you've still got that same variation. We've still got that variation within every age group on the farm. In cattle, it's exactly the same. We, even, we just have them on the farm for even longer. So what can we do about it? In an individual animal management system, where we actually understand the performance of the individuals, our aim is to find and remove those poor performers or the passengers in your system as early as we can. Now, when we can do that, it's heavily dependent on what the trait is and when we can record enough data to make that decision. But ultimately what we're trying to do is get the passengers out of the system and just have what were the average and superior performers. The other thing that's happening is these guys down the very bottom here. Some of those are the best performers genetically in your whole flock, but we kicked them out because they've had a birthday. Now, clearly they need to be fit, healthy, enough teeth, and every year older we keep an animal, we have a greater propensity for, for animal health issues. So we need to be conscious of that. But there are some bloody good animals that we're kicking out just because they've had a birthday. If we can find them, we can do something about it. So our aim is to get rid of the passengers and capitalise on the best performers for as long as we can. 
we're grabbing this bell-shaped curve every time we take a slice off the bottom. Every time we find some poor performers and we take them out, all we're doing is giving it a shove. We're changing the shape of that bell-shaped curve as we give it a shove. We can come back and we can give it another slice. So things get tight, identify the, the next lot of poorer performing animals, kick them off the farm. That's what we call generational improvement. We've got a generation of animals, an age group of animals, and we take a slice off the bottom. The group that we've got left is better than what we had yesterday. The group we've got in front of us today is better than what we had yesterday because we've taken those poorer performers out. So that's the generational component. What we can also achieve, and this varies depending on the heritability of the traits that you're selecting on, what we can also achieve is cumulative genetic gain over time as long as we do it appropriately and we know what we're selecting on. I want you to think about where your genetics are actually coming from. It doesn't matter whether we're talking sheep or cattle, but we spend a lot of time on the sire side. We spend a lot of time selecting on the sire side, and, and for particularly um, if we talk prime lamb, but in, in pretty much all livestock operations, we're not spending enough time on the maternal side. 50% of the genetics of the animals that stand in front of you has come from the maternal side. So are we applying enough selection pressure on them? Are we making sure that the maternal side is the best we can possibly have to match it up with what we're getting out of sire genetics? We can do some of this on farm. We know that in any group of animals, we've got variation in fleece values. I'll talk about that a bit more. We know there's going to be variation in who's had singles and twins over multiple years. And then there's other information that we can collect all the way through. We know within the, the progeny, there's going to be variations in lean meat yield meat eating quality. We look at a mob of animals and we constantly think of them as the mob and we constantly talk in averages. Average marking percentage, they're actually some of Gordon sheep. Average marking percentage in a mob of, that's been put back together, twins and singles, yeah, he marks 168%, fantastic. What happened inside that 168%? We know that there's sheep wandering around out there that didn't do a bloody thing for us. We know that there's sheep that are doing something near the average we know that there's a ewe like this one who constantly walks towards the camera which helps us for these photos and she's always got three lambs in tow. It's the same ewe shows up in a heap of photos that Gordon takes that he allows us to use because she constantly walks straight towards the camera and she's always got three lambs in tow. So my job, what I want to be able to do is find them. How can we find them? How can we capitalise on those animals? How can we stop just thinking about it as a mob? And how can we bugger that one off it hasn't done anything for us. Now that one's pretty straightforward. If we wet and dry up marking and identify everyone who lambed and lost, we can do that. We don't need EID for that. So I don't want to overcomplicate your system. A lot of this we can actually do without EID. But in terms of mindset, I want you to stop thinking about pretty sheep and start thinking about productive sheep. So I heard a great quote from Mark Ferguson the other day. I'm pretty sure he stole it from someone else. But it was, breed the sheep that makes you the money and learn to like it, the look of it. Pretty simple concept. So in terms of productivity, and I said about that variation in wool value, the sheep CRC did work a number of years ago looking at what commercial flocks were doing at the time. Now don't get too hung up on what the wool values are. It's all relative in terms of, of what we're looking at here. But what they found in a commercial merino flock, the top 25% of that flock were cutting $82 worth of wool within each mob. $82 worth of wool, the top 25%. The average for that group of animals was only $54. So what's that tell us the bottom 25% were doing? Bugger all. When they started looking at fertility, what was actually happening within a group of commercial merinos? They found that the top 25% were marking 143% lambs. But the average for the group of animals was only 86. So again, what's that tell us the bottom 25% are doing? Not a hell of a lot. Now we know that some of these guys will be doing this, some of these guys will be doing this. We also know some of these, cutting all the wool, are also able to do this, and we know that some of these guys that are doing bugger all are doing it in both camps. The thing is we need to find them. We need to be able to find them to identify them and, and actually make that selection pressure. We start talking about measuring actual lamb production. This is 800 odd lambs that we recorded growth rates from birth to weaning. So they've got an assumed birth weight and then, and then a calculation through to weaning. We talk as an industry about trying to get 
lambs doing 300 grams a day. Look how many of these were doing over 400 grams a day. Look how many of them were doing over 500 grams a day. The reason I actually put this graph up is nothing to do with any of that. It's because you'll see the, two, the three top lambs up there, the highest growth rates. Are they singles or twins? We would assume that surely they have to be singles, wouldn't they? I'd walk into a pen full of lambs and I'd see those three that are the, going to be the biggest, fattest, shiniest lambs and I would go, oh yeah, those three are singles. Except I know what they are. Two of those are twins. Not from the same set of twins, but two of them are twins because we were able to track them. That shows us that we just don't know what's happening inside our flock. Inside each mob, we've got this massive variation. That group averaged 385 grams a day. But what if we could actually match that back to the U? What if I can find these three lambs? That's what I want to be able to do. I want to be able to find them. I want to know how many kilos is that U actually producing for me. Then we're really getting somewhere. Now we've done it, and I don't suggest everyone runs out and, and does this, but we've used Pedigree Matchmaker, which was designed by the Sheep CRC. This is how it works. We've got a panel reader on a single file entrance. You can see how these users have got pretty used to it since the car was parked right next to them. But it reads the tag as the ewe walks through, reads the tags of the lambs. We then drop it into some software developed by the Sheep CRC, and it estimates the association between ewes and lambs. If a lamb's followed a ewe a certain number of times, then we can predict that it belongs to that ewe. Not amazingly accurate, but pretty good, especially on a commercial basis. It's not easy to do. You saw how dry that was at that time. Water is a great attractant. But if we're in a wet spring, it's bloody hard to get them going through, and you need a lot of records for it to work. We've done it with cattle as well. The concept works exactly the same in cattle. The reason I'm interested in it, and it, it, so the, re the reason I say that I don't recommend it for everybody is because it's difficult. What we're going to see is over time, other technologies are going to replace that. So proximity tags that allow us to estimate associations between lambs and ewes, DNA to be able to match with parentage as well. Those things will overtake it because it is a, a, a more difficult task to use pedigree matchmaker. The reason I'm interested in it is as soon as I can link lambs to ewes, I can produce a graph like this one. So each one of those dots is a ewe. Up the side is the kilograms of lamb weaned per ewe. Why would there be a gap through the middle here? Anyone want to have a guess? Singles and twins. Yep. Down here are all our singles. Up here are all our twins. Up here are all our triplets. So next time someone says to you, no, I just want one good single. I don't want bloody twins. Just one good single. Singles cannot compete with twins. Twins cannot compete with triplets. Yes, there's some challenges in getting the survival and everything else, but there is no competition in it. It gives us an idea of actually how much each of our users is producing for us. We can convert that to dollars. We can see that some of these users haven't produced a damn thing for us. Now, if you're a composite flock and she's cutting you $4 worth of wool, and she's down here in terms of lamb production, that hurts. But it also gives us that opportunity to see just how much variation there is. And you can do it over multiple years. The real reason for wanting to look at a graph like that is to be able to say, why are these guys still here? Or why they've been joined back to a maternal. Or if that was Merinos, why are we joining them to Merino? Put them to a terminal. We might still need them for stocking rate, but let's bugger them off. The other factor is that these guys have gone missing. The humble Australian weather has gone missing out of the national flock. Quick show of hands, who here has Merino weathers? Yep, that's about what we get, two. Now, the reason that I bring this up is because no one ever gets emotionally attached to weathers. So as soon as pressure comes on, it's a no-brainer. We'll just bugger the weathers off. But for everyone else, whether it's sheep or cattle, who has close to 100% breeder operation, you don't have that same flexibility unless you've got a group of animals that you know you can punt straight away. We're just going to get rid of them. That's what I want you to build into your system is the flexibility to say, these guys, so the pressure comes on, I need to reduce my stocking rate. Great, I've got a group of animals that I don't like that much. I've got a group of animals that don't perform as well. So if I sell them, my flock tomorrow is better than it was yesterday. Sure, there's not as many of them, but I've managed to manipulate my stocking rate, and I've got a better flock than what I had. This is what we want to be able to use. We know the bell-shaped curve exists in your flock. We want to be able to use it. We want to take the slice off the bottom. So why use EID? It's pretty simple. It's more accurate, it's easier, it's faster, and that makes it more likely to happen. The one thing I don't want you to get trapped into the thought process of, though, is thinking that it's going to save you heaps of labour. 
we often look at ag tech and people say, oh yeah, we'll get some labour saving out of that. You get labour saving if it replaces a job you were already doing. So let's say I was reading ear tags, writing down the tag number and recording something against them. That's what I always did in my sheep flock. Now I go and get EID and I use that instead. Absolutely there's a labour saving there for me. But if you weren't recording that in the first place, and now we go and get EID and we start recording things, you're adding labour, not removing it. So just be conscious of that. Yes, this is a great way to record data, fantastic way to record data. But you need to be conscious of the fact that you are actually adding a job, not removing one in, in most cases. So I want you to start simple. One of the simplest things you can do is to realise that on the outside of your tags you have a visual number. The visual number when we read a tag electronically, it produces an RFID number. There is no link between those two numbers except for in the bucket file. So that's why there's a dirty old bucket on there. Strange name for the file, but it's a bucket file. That's where those two numbers come together. When you order your tags, you can make sure, or you should make sure that you get the bucket file because that's where those two numbers are matched up. All it is is a CSV file or a spreadsheet and those two numbers are matched up. The reason I want you to know that is that we can actually do some really simple recording without even using a, a stick reader or a panel reader. You can start now, today, putting tags into LAMs and recording information. The way we can do it, if I know what the, the number is, the visual number on the outside of that tag is, when I go to mark my LAMs, I can just keep track of which tags we use for which mob. So today we're going to mark twins. I make sure that as I'm getting the tags out of the box, that I'm getting the, all of the ones from 1 to 427 are going to go into twins. Fantastic. Write it in your notebook. Don't put your notebook through the washing machine. Write it in your notebook. As soon as we do that, then all we've got to do is go back to the bucket file and I can use that information, 1 to 487 or whatever the number was that we're using, I can go back into the bucket file and I can match that against the RFID number, the electronic number. That gives us straight away birth status. And birth status is a really important thing for us to keep track of. If we're looking at a prime lamp operation, the things that I would normally talk to our clients about, I want a, a basic set of things that we're going to start recording. We start with birth status. And the reason we start with birth status is I need to make sure that we're not unfairly treating our twins. Are we looking at twins and saying, that's not good, that's not a great animal, it doesn't look that good, because that's what, what ends up happening is we, we look at a twin and we say, oh no, it's not as good and we end, we end up culling it. Because we didn't know it was a twin. I want to know whether it's a twin or single all the way through its life. Pregnancy status is another thing that we can record quite easily. If your pregnancy scanner is set up, they can record it automatically for you. Or at the very worst, you might have to run your mob around again so that you have your singles there, you get your stick reader, you name it as singles singles from orange tags, whatever it is, you go along, you read each tag. In that file now you have recorded they were singles. Same with your twins. It's not the end of the world to have to run them around and do that again, um, but ideally it would be nice if, you, if your scanner can do it automatically for you. And the other one, depending on what sort of flock you're running, a mature weight, one and a half year old weight, a standard reference weight for your flock. So particularly if we're talking composites, just to make sure that we're not ending up with ridiculous size U's. It's a problem for the industry. We're getting too many very large use. So we can apply a bit of downward selection pressure if we're recording that as well. If we go to a simple merino operation, again, I start with birth status. I start with birth status because for 150 years we've been selecting against fertility in merinos. Because when we, don't, when we didn't have this information, we, didn't, we weren't tracking singles versus twins, the twins were just getting culled because they weren't as good and the wool wasn't quite as good. And so they would always get dropped out. We were always favouring singles. We can avoid that simply by knowing and only ever comparing twins with twins, singles with singles. Then we start looking at some fleece traits. So this again depends on what your objective is. But fleece weight, micron, we can do that with in-shed testing or you can do it with side sampling and sending the samples off. And then again, I would look at a one and a half year old standard reference weight as something that we might want to use. Particularly if you want to be able to generate a... Um, uh, if you want to be able to generate your own index to be able to use within flock, then we might need a live weight in there. Beyond that, if you've got a real focus on fertility, then also we'd start recording pregnancy status. Mainly because it's a simple one to record. The sheep are already in the yards. The scanner's already there. I don't want to add tasks to your job. I like to capture data while they're in the yards anyway. 
And that birth status one is really important because it can stop us from making mistakes. If we go in blindly selecting on something like fleece weight and we don't pay attention to what the other flow-on effects are going to be, potentially in fertility and even in your micron, then you're going to get yourself into trouble. You're going to end up taking yourself down a path you didn't realise you were going down. So before you go and do this, you need to set your objectives. You need to understand what the implications are going to be. You also need to be ask, able to ask yourself, every time you're going to cull a breeder, is it her fault or yours? Because unfortunately, a lot of the time, it is actually our fault, not hers, that she might not have performed. We need to be able to de decipher between the lack of performance versus the lack of opportunity. So we've got to hold the mirror up to ourselves. This is probably the most complex graph I've ever produced. So I'm going to talk you through it, but it, it proves a really good point for us. So this was, again, using pedigree matchmaker, matching lambs to use. Across the bottom here, we've got you live weight. So the live weight of those ewes at weaning. Up the side here, we've got kilograms of lamb weaned. So what did they actually produce for us? And the colour of the dot tells us what the condition score of the ewe was at weaning. And the reason we recorded all of this was because I knew what was happening in too many flocks. And that is, if I'm on the drafting gate and someone sends a mob of ewes at me at weaning, we're going to draft some off because we want to, we've, we've got to drop some numbers. We want to get rid of some animals out of that, that mob. The ones that I keep tend to be these guys over here. High weight, high condition score, that's why they're all purple and, and blue dots. They look fat and shiny, they look amazing at weaning. They're all wet, they've all, they've all reared a lamb. I'm keeping them in because they look amazing and I think, geez, they've done a good job, except when I know what they've actually produced for me. You look at how much they've produced, and this whole group of animals down here, these guys, they're big and fat and shiny because they've done bugger all for us. Meanwhile, there's a group of animals up here that have done a hell of a job. They're lower in live weight because they're lower in condition score. They've put everything into their lambs and they've actually produced a hell of a lot. You look at that. That's a 60 kilo ewe. She's weaned 70 odd kilos of lamb. Any wonder she's in lighter condition score. She's been working bloody hard for me. This can help us stop making mistakes by culling only on visual and not on objective measurement. The big thing I want you to ask yourself, though, is why are we doing it in the first place? So you should always start with an objective, a written objective. We'll talk about that later in the day, but you should know what you're trying to achieve in the first place and then work backwards from there. But just imagine a dairy farmer getting up, milking their cows morning and night, not paying any attention to how much milk went into the vat. If you've got a cropping operation, imagine you're running your cropping operation. All you do is work out at the end of the year, we produce this many tonnes of wheat. Don't pay any attention to what paddock it came from. These days we want to know what part of the paddock it came from. And yet in our sheep operations, we just say we produce this many lambs. Or we cut this much wool. I want to know who it's coming from. The trap is you can't improve what you don't measure, but understanding the information is critical. Das hier ist mein Sektor. Das hier ist das wichtigste Gerät des Küstenwächters. Das Gerät und das Gerät. Überlebensradar. Hello? This is the German Coast Guard. We are thinking, we're thinking. What are you thinking about? The collection of data is a complete waste of time and money unless you're actually going to use it. Now, our experience in Victoria was very much this. We had a whole lot of early adopters go and put electronic ID in. They collected truckloads of data. And they would say to me, oh, you should see the spreadsheets I've got. It's amazing. I've got all these spreadsheets. I've got all this information. And I'd say to them, what are you going to do with it? And they'd say, I don't know, but it's going to be good. <laughs> that's not what we're here for. We don't want to add labour to your business. We've got to get information that's going to help inform your decisions. That's the whole concept. We start with the end point in mind. We work back from there. If EID can play a role for you, great. Let's work out how we can do it in the simplest possible way. If you sit down and you look at your objective and you've got bigger fish to, fish to fry, then EID is not for you yet. It's that simple. In terms of equipment, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because you can go and talk to a whole lot of people after lunch down in the, in the trade displays. The only thing I'm going to say is that when I first started, we didn't have any of this. Twelve years ago, we didn't have any of these equipment options. They're all new. 
that's the great advantage we've had is this explosion in equipment. So I'm happy to talk to people. If anyone wants to talk to me about brands and anything else, we can do that one-on-one -on -one, um, throughout the day. But we've had all of this technology develop in this last 10 years. That's the big advantage that we now have in terms of, of looking at EID. Auto drafters, handlers, they're all amazing. I can show you quickly a, a video we made just, just shows you how an auto drafter can work. So all we did in this one, we've rattled each of those sheep and we've recorded the colour of the rattle against their ear tag so that I can draft the reds off to the left, blues off to the right and anything without a rattle is going straight ahead. That could be on any possible data. That could be off to the left is going anything with a fleece weight, uh, sorry, a fleece value above $70 who's had twins two years in a row. It could be anyone who has reared less than 50 kilograms of lamb, weaned, going off to the right. We can use any amount of data and we can get an auto drafter to be able to draft that automatically for us. This is the bit we want to get to. This is the, the application of the decision as opposed to just bright and shiny things. The one thing I would say is it doesn't always go smoothly. Now, lead up, and, and you'll hear from Ben about handlers and things later on today, your lead up is as or more important than the handler itself, or the auto drafter itself. When we made that video, things didn't quite go according to plan all the time. So, this lead up doesn't have any backing devices and if you get a hesitant sheep, it doesn't quite go in. These ones had been through a lot and so we had to have that back gate only opening slightly so that they would push their way in and the next sheep couldn't get its head in. The problem is when you get one doing that. It requires someone to come along and give it a shove. You'll see me poking away in there in a moment. So you can overcome that quite well with a double lead up race so that the hesitant sheep gets a chance to wait. What's happening here at the moment is we're reading that ear tag of that sheep out there. Because it's come and stood next to a panel reader, your panel reader reads out both sides, not just into the, into the race. So we're currently drafting things the wrong way, and I'm saying, bugger off. And you would think you couldn't be that unlucky. Why the hell would a sheep come and stand there? Um, shouldn't really happen. We should have that fenced off. But just when you think that maybe we were just a bit unlucky, a bit later on, it happens again, and we end up with two of them coming around to stand there. See them wander around in a second. Here they come. We've got one here and another one besides these will come over as well. Point being, your setup is really important because if this happens and I'm implementing the decision and I get these two stupid lambs standing on the outside, we're reading their tags instead of the one in the auto drafter, my decision's useless. We've just drafted things completely the wrong way. There you go, we're reading two different tags. So, we can also get it in cattle. Auto drafters in cattle are now a real thing, which is fantastic. You can spend any amount of money on handlers, auto drafters, readers. The aim is to know what you're wanting to do with it in the first place. That should be what the investment decision is based on. We can also get variable rate drench guns. So, if you've got an animal standing in front of, in a handler in front of you, then it will adjust the dose rate in that drench gun so that you apply the right amount of drench to that animal, to the individual animal. Fantastic bit of technology. They're not cheap. We've got a few clients that just as an interim step, we've got two drench guns hanging over the handler that have got different dose rates. So that if we've got an animal that's a certain weight, we grab the right drench gun to give you the, the right dose rate. The next step is to think about what's happening off farm. And where does EID play a role and what technologies are coming that are going to flow back into information on your farm? So lamb processing, processing right now, and this is probably my greatest frustration over the last 10 years, is where the hook tracking systems are at. And it's not a, it's, this isn't a frustration directed at anyone, they're bloody hard to get going. So what happens is basically anywhere that the, the ear tag that's in that lamb gets matched to the hook that that lamb is hanging on, and then everywhere it goes through the plant, we know who that lamb is and where it's from. It means that we can record individual carcass weights against animals. We can actually, if they hit the retain rail and they need to be trimmed, they've got arthritis and they need to take off a shoulder. Instead of you just getting a kill sheet with a 14 kilo carcass, you'll actually get the information to say, you had a 14 kilo carcass, it was this animal, and it was because we took, it had, it had arthritis in, in the front joint and we had to take it off at the shoulder. That starts to mean something to us. The challenge is, an abattoir is a really hard place to get technology to work in because there's so much steel, there's so much electrical noise, there's so much hot and cold, um, and so that's been a bit of a challenge. It will get overcome. We've got hook tracking systems um, working in some plants, 
Um, so you, you will have, some of you will have seen Gundagai. Um, they've started uh, being able to record in, with an intention to being able to do value-based payment system. So where it's all heading, and this is the exciting part, when a lamb comes onto a kill chain, the way it's going to work is that that lamb will come through and go through a, a DEXA unit or an X-ray unit. As each carcass comes through, it creates essentially a road map of that carcass. And that's matched to the hook so we know exactly which lamb it is and where it is in the plant. And they can map bone structure, they can map where the best cuts, the most efficient cuts are going to be. Amazing for the processor. The other exciting bit is this same DEXA unit can help us predict lean meat yield. So for you, you can actually get paid on how much saleable meat is in your lamb rather than just a carcass weight. If you're breeding really good product, you'll get rewarded for it. If we just go selecting for lean meat yield though, it's antagonistic with meat eating quality. So we need to be able to measure meat eating quality at the same time. Now, this one, um, this slide was from Alex Ball from MLA, but this is the work that's still ongoing. But there is the ability to be able to measure meat eating quality at chain speed. So remembering, so that there's a couple of things that have been tried over time, hyperspectral camera, impedance spectroscopy probe, there is this happening in real time. Remembering that a lamb on a chain is, we've got 13 lambs a minute going past, so everything needs to be done at speed. So the ability to be able to pay you on lean meat yield and on meat eating quality means that we're producing the right product, you're getting rewarded for producing the right product. From a processor point of view though, the robotics allow them amazing efficiency. I'll show you a couple of quick examples. So each one of these cuts that's happening is happening because that's the right spot for that individual carcass. The cuts aren't happening at exactly the same spot on every carcass. It's, it's all tailored to the individual carcass. So you see here, for that carcass straight through is the most efficient cut. For the next one, it angles the blades. This next one you're going to see, it will take the four quarter. It'll x-ray it again so that it gets a more accurate picture of what it needs to do with that four quarter. So creating a 3D image, which you'll see, every one of those lines is where that bandsaw is going to cut that four quarter. So that robot's about to use a bandsaw to break that four quarter down. So we're not going to see all of this technology in every kill floor. Some of it will be the more, like the breaking down into quarters. They can do, so you, ALC at Colac, for instance, They've had robots in for quite a while now that are doing some of those bigger cuts. In terms of boning though, I just want to show you what's possible with a robot and just how accurate this can be because it is pretty bloody amazing. So we won't see this on many kill floors or many boning rooms, but it just shows what the robots are capable of. So this one is the hindquarter. It's actually going to grab this hindquarter and it's going to bone it out. Pretty amazing. Now they don't turn up hungover, they actually do turn up. They don't smoke bongs, they don't have girlfriend issues, boyfriend issues. They work 24 hours a day. Their payback on these robots is actually really surprisingly quick, even though they're a very expensive piece of gear. 
So bring you back to that question, what excites you about the livestock industry? There are plenty of things that should be exciting us about the livestock industry. I will remind you though, that it's not the tools. Each one of these things, whether it's EID or any of the other things you look at today, they're just tools. Ultimately, the change comes from you. The progress, the improving profitability, it comes from you. The definition of technology is the application of scientific knowledge for practical purposes. It's not something that needs a battery. It's not something that, that is a, a bright and shiny thing. It is the application of scientific knowledge. It's a solution to your problem. So your first job is to find what your problem is. And then you work out what tools are going to help you do that. Have a plan, keep it simple. After all, whatever we do well today, we can do better tomorrow. Thanks very much.